No, we got to do it better than that. That's better. Subcommittee on Federal Lands will come to order. I'm assuming the mic is on here. It sounds like it's good, huh? Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to Cochise College here in Sierra Vista, Arizona. And um, let's see here. Yeah, thank you to Dr. Rottweiler. Where are, where are you? You're right here. Yeah, terrific. First of all, thank you very much for the challenge coin. We appreciate that very much. And thank you so much for host, uh, hosting this in your beautiful college here in Sierra Vista. We really appreciate it. We're here for an official Natural Resources Subcommittee on Federal Lands oversight hearing entitled Biden's Border Crisis, The Consequences of Failing to Secure Federal Border Lands. My name is Tom Tiffany. I am the chairman of the subcommittee and represent the 7th District of Wisconsin, right underneath Lake Superior. The subcommittee is meeting today to discuss the Biden administration's ongoing failure to secure our nation's southern border. It has become a true national security, environmental, and humanitarian crisis. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everybody about the rules of decorum for official congressional proceedings. I ask that there not be any kind of disruption regarding the testimony given here today. It is important that we respect the decorum and the rules of the committee and of the House of Representatives and to allow the members and the public to hear our proceedings. Now, we will begin our hearing with a presentation of the colors by the Tombstone High School Junior ROTC. I will ask that everyone please rise for the presentation of the colors. Now we will be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by Representative Siskamani. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Congressman Siskamani. Now, for a few additional housekeeping items, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. I ask unanimous consent that the following members be allowed to participate in today's hearing from the dais. The gentleman from Washington and the chairman of the Congressional Western Caucus, Mr. Newhouse. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Siskamani. The gentleman from California, Mr. LaMalfa. The gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins. The gentleman from Georgia, Georgia, Mr. Carter, the gentlewoman from Minnesota, Ms. Fishbach, and the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Hearn. Without objection, so ordered. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and the ranking minority member. I therefore ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted in accordance with committee rule 3, parent O. Without objection, so ordered. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. I want to begin by thanking the people here in Sierra Vista for hosting us here today. Um, it is our pleasure to be in this, um, uh, this beautiful community. And um, uh, my only disappointment coming from northern Wisconsin, we always, when we go to Arizona, we expect 70 degrees. 
I would also like to thank Representative Siskamani and the Congressional Western Caucus led by Chairman Dan Newhouse for helping make this the most widely attended field hearing held by the Natural Resources Committee this Congress. We are here to discuss a vital subject, one that has doubtlessly affected everyone in this city and in similar communities throughout Arizona and the entire Southwest. Under President Biden, the situation at the southern border has spiraled completely out of control. During his term, United States Customs and Border Protection has recorded more than six million encounters with illegal immigrants crossing into the U.S. from Mexico. Added to that are the more than 1.7 million migrants who successfully evaded border officials during the same period. Since significant numbers of convicted criminals, known gang members, and suspected terrorists have crossed the southern border in recent years, the Biden administration's failure to apprehend or even adequately screen the millions of people pouring into our country is an appalling security failure. Further, under President Biden's watch, a full 90 to 95 percent of the illegal narcotics carried by smugglers across the southern border makes it through without being seized. In fact, more than 90 percent of the fentanyl currently circulating in the U.S. enters the country this way. And I would just say we took a little side trip here today, and it's not hard to understand why all that fentanyl is pouring into our country when the border checkpoints are not manned because they are off having to do other things. This helps explain why fentanyl overdose kills roughly 70,000 Americans annually and is now the leading cause of death for Americans aged 18 to 45. Here in Arizona, the Customs and Border Protection's Tucson sector has become the busiest in the nation for illegal drug smuggling. You may be asking, why is the Natural Resources Committee interested in this issue? Every person in this room knows the effects of illegal immigration on our communities, but few know about the damage and destruction illegal immigration has on our public lands. We're here today to bring attention to this issue. Roughly 40 percent of the southern border is made up of federal lands, and in Arizona, 80 percent of border lands are owned by the federal government. As the immigration surge has overwhelmed official ports of entry, migrants have been pouring into Arizona's public lands, which are more remote and less easily patrolled. Each of these illegal migrants leaves behind an estimated six to eight pounds of trash. Last year, more than 28,000 pounds of trash were picked up by the federal officials in Arizona along the southern border. This is barely scratching the surface. With more than 2.4 million illegal crossings last year, it's likely that illegal immigrants left a minimum of 14.4 million pounds of trash. Let me say that again. Illegal immigration is causing millions of pounds of trash to pile up on our federal lands. In many cases, this environmental degradation is happening in our most sensitive landscapes, wildlife refuges, national monuments, and wilderness areas. Many of you have probably been to the Coronado National Memorial, which is a mere 30 minute drive from here. A National Park Service employee at the Coronado reported that the trash piles there have grown so large that they have become resting spots for illegal immigrants who then need to be airlifted out of this ecologically sensitive area at enormous expense to the taxpayer. You cannot call yourself a true conservationist unless you are willing to take a hard look at the environmental toll illegal immigration is having on our public lands. Unfortunately, with all the effects that illegal immigration is having on our society, the consequences for our federal lands are often the last issues to receive attention. We are here today to get the message out about the importance of conserving our federal lands and securing our border. Today, I took the time this morning to go through the Buenos Aires National Wildlife Refuge to the Coronado National Forest, and the photos I'm about to show you are from today. I want to thank Sean Wilson and his crew for um, escorting me out there to see what is going on. Uh, first of all, um, you will see a pile of firewood. This is firewood that has been harvested in the Coronado National Forest. Uh, go to the second uh, slide, if you would, the, uh, the fire. And here we have the firewood being burned. There is no permit that is being taken out on this. You, as Americans, would have to get a permit. You would have to get uh, the right to be able to do that. This is just happening in our national forest not far from here. 
Slide three, you'll see the trash and food piles, all stacked up in the national forest. And finally, we found lots of these. Catholic Charities, American Red Cross, who are helping facilitate this. And I understand that their mission, they say, is humanitarian. There is nothing humanitarian about what is happening to so, to so many migrants that are coming across our southern border, how they are being abused by the cartels. There is nothing humanitarian about it. Catholic Charities and other NGOs need to reconsider what they're doing with their facilitation of the greatest, the greatest um, human trafficking effort, perhaps in the history of the world since slavery. As some of you may know, when on federal lands, there are strict rules on where campsites and campfires are allowed, and permits can be required. But it appears these rules and regulations are reserved for the citizens of this country. All those pouring over illegally face zero repercussions for their blatant disregard for our public lands and the environment, as shown from our visit today. So not only do they get free flights around our country, free health care, and access to our schools, but they also get to trash and leave human waste on our public lands as their welcoming gift. I want to thank all the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to the insights that each of you will bring to this important discussion. With that, I will now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Westerman, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Tiffany, and thank you to your work and the work of the subcommittee staff in organizing uh, this federal lands field hearing today. Uh, these are hearings that we uh, try to do across the country in many different places uh, to address the concerns of the Natural Resources Committee. And as Chairman Tiffany noted, we have a major concern with our federal lands on our southern border. Uh, again, I also want to recognize and extend my thanks to Representative Siskamani. We're here in his district today for his leadership on these issues and many more issues in the House. Uh, and as Chairman Tiffany said, we're re uh, we have several members of the Western Caucus that are with us, including uh, Chairman Dan Newhouse. Dan, thank you for organizing the site visits and for all your work in highlighting issues that are important to the West and to rural America. Uh, we just returned from a trip to the border uh, to see firsthand, once again, the challenges our law enforcement personnel face securing our border uh, under this administration. I first came to the Arizona border in, uh, I believe it was 2018. See some familiar faces here, Art. Um, and came out here looking at the same thing uh, Representative Tiffany was talking about, the trash on our federal lands. Uh, how there's a double standard in our country for an American to use our federal lands versus uh, an illegal coming across the border and trashing our federal lands, as you saw uh, on this, uh, this picture. I thought we had a bad border crisis at the time. It was nothing, nothing in 2018 like we're facing now. Um, each trip I've made out here and, and on the Texas border and other places along the border shows me that the situation is getting worse. It's not getting better. It's unfortunate because the witnesses before us today are faced with the consequences of weak border policies that cripple the ability of our federal, state, and local law enforcement to fully protect our people, our lands, and our freedom. People often don't realize just how much of our southern borders comprise of federal lands under the jurisdiction of this committee. In Arizona, 80% of the border is federal land, uh, and I've personally met with C uh, CBP officials who have told me just how difficult it is to patrol the border on the federal lands. I had opportunity to fly the border, uh, the whole Arizona border. It's some rough country out there, some open country out there. And uh, I live in Arkansas, I don't think, uh, the people in my state or other parts of the country realize just how vast and open and difficult uh, this border is. These agents who are just trying to do their jobs lack accessible roads and physical barriers that are proven to deter illegal immigration. In some areas, restrictive designations such as wilderness mean they must stop active pursuit of dangerous criminals because they can't use uh, their ATVs. When we fail to secure our federal lands, we fail to secure our border. And the crisis we have now at the border is unprecedented. Last year, roughly two and a half million people crossed 
into this country illegally. That's a 43% increase from two years prior. This just isn't common sense. Our CBP agents should have the access they need to do their jobs and have operational control of the border. When we fail to do so, it leads to a series of national security, environmental, and humanitarian crises. Due to the, the remoteness, federal lands are often targeted by bad actors. Drug and human traffickers seek out remote areas to access the country. Illegal immigrants cut trails through sensitive wildlife habitat. They start wildfires and leave behind an estimated uh, six to eight pounds of trash, as Representative Tiffany talked about. That's per person. Illegal immigration also deters members of the public from visiting these areas. This is unacceptable. Every American should feel safe and comfortable recreating on and visiting our public lands. Unfortunately, every town is now a border town and every state is a border state. This is true of our federal lands as well, where the impacts of illegal immigration can be felt from miles away, I'll say thousands of miles away. In California, dangerous cartels grow illegal marijuana on federal forest lands. The proceeds from illegal cultivation are funding cartels, human trafficking, and a host of other illegal issues. The Biden administration is housing illegal migrants on National Park Service land in Brooklyn, New York. Right here in Arizona, illegal immigrants discard millions of pounds of trash, cut trails through sensitive wildlife habitat, and start wildfires. Today, we'll hear stories and firsthand accounts from our panel of witnesses describing the harm a porous border causes on families, ranchers, and farmers, local communities, law enforcement, and at the end of the day, on all of our citizens of our country. These stories resonate with each of us. I want to thank each of the witnesses for being here today. I want to thank uh, the college for providing this excellent hearing space. And uh, we had an opportunity to meet with Sheriff Daniels this morning. He said something, I think he put it more succinct than I've heard it said by anybody else. He said, this isn't just an immigration crisis anymore. It's an organized crime crisis. That's what's happening in the United States of America, and you know firsthand here in Arizona how that affects so many people. Our Constitution says that Congress makes the laws, the administration enforces the laws, and the judicial system interprets the laws. Congress has made laws that give the administration uh, the power uh, to do eight things that could be done right now. We could end catch and release. We can reinstate the Remain in Mexico policy. We can enter into asylum cooperative agreements. We can end parole abuses. We can detain inadmissible aliens. We can use expedited, expedited removal. We can rein in taxpayer-funded benefits for illegal aliens. And we can issue a proclamation to suspend, to restrict entry. Those authorities are already there. There's one person, one person in the United States of America that can do that. That's the President of the United States, and I call on him today to do his job and to protect our country, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your testimony. I now turn to uh, Congressman Siskamani, who represents this district, for his opening statement. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Tiffany and Chairman Westerman and uh, all of my colleagues for being here in Sierra Vista uh, to examine what's happening firsthand. I, I thank you for showing up. I think showing up is a a great example of the interest and the, and the true care that we have for this issue and our resolve to, <clears throat> to do what we can on the Congress side and continue to do that to fix this issue. I'd also like to thank Coaches College, of course, for hosting us all here today. And uh, I especially also want to thank the witnesses. I know every single one of you personally, and, and I know how busy you are, and I know <clears throat> how much you've been dealing and struggling with this issue for as long as you have. So I want to say thank you so much for all the work that you've done, but also being here to lend your expertise and um, show my colleagues why I'm so proud to represent all of you in the United States Congress. And I also want to thank everybody in the audience today. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here. Thank you for caring. Thank you for doing all that you can as well, uh, as this is uh, something that's been impacting everyone in different ways. So I want to thank everyone for that. As anyone uh, in southeastern Arizona knows well, the border crisis and crises are not a new phenomenon for us. 
they are a result of a combination of the broken immigration system and lack of desire by the federal government to enforce the laws and uh, just a plethora of other issues as well and other factors. Yet what we see here in Sierra Vista and in the Tucson sector is quite unique compared to a lot of the southwest border. It's bad actors, cartels and organized crime pushing fentanyl, migrants, and whatever else they want, as they have more control over the area than anyone else, and we've seen that. The other thing that makes the areas on the border unique is that 80% of the southern border uh, land is on federal lands. This creates extra burdens on our local and federal law enforcement as well. CBP officials have publicly stated these vast areas of federal land, quote, provide transition, transnational criminal organizations significant opportunities to cross their products and are, and most of them are uh, crossed by who have a criminal record, are smuggling illegal narcotics or weapons or are aliens from specific interest countries, end quote. CBP encounters with migrants uh, in the state's Tucson sector are already up over 140 percent in fiscal year 2024. Many people don't know that. Many people assume that the worst part of the border crisis is happening in other states. However, it is right here in this sector. This is, the, this is ground zero for this. And at the beginning of the year, we experienced a port of entry closure here in Arizona in Lukeville. I was very vocal against that closing. Uh, as temporary as it was, it was harmful. This is in addition to all of our border patrol checkpoints being closed as well. When ports of entry are closed, trade and commerce suffers. We heard that this morning from a panel as well. That's one of the very unique things about this uh, two-day trip that my colleagues and I are taking. It's focused on the border security aspect of it, but it's also focused on the environmental impact, the humanitarian impact on trade and commerce. We heard from these people at the border that are crossing um, trade and, and commerce and goods and services across of how much it impacts what's happening here. So when the ports of entries are closed, trade and commerce will suffer. And this should be unacceptable. But on top of that, when ports of entry are closed and overrun, migrants have been pouring into Arizona's more remote and less easily guarded territories, namely the federal lands. We've seen reports of smugglers and cartels actively directing migrants towards Arizona's sparsely populated public lands, border areas, and as a means of entering the United States. One thing that is very tragic as well as I know we'll hear from uh, our panel is the morale of our Border Patrol agents and how much they're suffering. So I do want to take that, this point right now to thank them also for all their work and being in the front lines for us every single day. Moreover, when you have bad actors, they often don't want to be caught and encountered by CBP. So instead, to evade direction, uh, they often are smuggled north. One of the consequences of this is that they often end up in a vehicle on a high-speed chase with law enforcement um, if they are caught. That's why I introduced H.R. 5585. I'm not going to say that was my idea. That actually came from a meeting that I had with local law enforcement here and Border Patrol agents when I said, well, as soon as I came into Congress, what's one bill that I could pass that we could introduce that would address some of the issues that you have? Name me one. And they named uh, a, a description of what we ended up passing. We were proud to pass that bill uh, through the U.S. House of Representatives last week with bipartisan support, including every single one of the members that is on this table that voted for that bill today. So thank you to my colleagues for that. This is a reality here in Cochise County, and I know our witnesses are well equipped to speak on these issues. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh Thank you, Mr. Siscomani. Uh, next, we're going to turn to our witness panel. Let me remind the witnesses that under committee rules, you must limit your oral statement to five minutes, but your entire statement will appear in the hearing record. To begin your testimony, uh, please press the on button on the microphone. We use timing lights. When you begin, the light will turn green. At the end of five minutes, the light will turn red, and I'll ask you to please complete your statement. Now I'd like to recognize our first witness, the Honorable Mayor McCaw of uh, Sierra Vista. Thank you for joining us today. Sir, you have five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon to the chair, distinguished mem members of this community. I appreciate the opportunity to address this committee regarding the issues that our city is having from the perspective of a mayor and community leader. I've served the people of Sierra Vista as mayor for the past 12 months, and prior to that, I retired as a combat service disabled veteran of the great United States Army. 
Additionally, I will submit my view from, uh, from the perspective of a father, husband, mentor, and a pastor. Sarah Vista is, has a population of 45,000 and is located about 20 miles from the U.S. border with Mexico. Sarah Vista does not, doesn't really feel like a border town. It's a military community to the home of the Army installation, Fort Huachuca, which is the home of the Buffalo Soldier. But it is the greatest city in the United States, and I stand by that remark. As I stated before, Sarah Vista is 20 miles north of Naco, Arizona, and it's rare for the dangerous border issues you sometimes read about to impact Sarah Vista. In fact, some of the national rhetoric on border issues makes it harder for us to attract businesses, visitors to our city because people assume the area is much more dangerous than it really is. I don't want to add any false perceptions about our violent crime to, in our community, but for the past three years, the trend of young people being recruited as so -car, low car drivers does pose a real threat to our residents and visitors, which fuels these narratives about the violence near the border. Often using social media, cartels in Mexico recruit residents in the United States to travel to the border, pick up migrants whom the cartels refer as lows and transfer them north in exchange for money. With two main thoroughfares coming through Terra Vista, which lies in the path of those low car drivers who travel north through our community to, and proceed. In 2020, the Sierra Vista Police Department responded to 19 vehicle pursuits in our city and that total increased to 13 in 2021. In 2022, the number of, of it increased to 50 pursuits. In 2023, we saw 70 pursuits, where our police department was the primary pursuing agency in 41 pursuits and assisted in 29 other pursuits. The average speed of these low car drivers in those 41 pursuits was 90.5 miles an hour coming through our city. Those low car drivers who often are teenagers or young adults are encouraged to drive recklessly throughout town to discourage pursuits. This has created extremely dangerous situations include low car drivers speeding through elementary school zones and crashing into bicyclists. Two other incidents resulted in serious accidents at major intersections in town, which one in the north ended in a fatality. Several more incidents resulted in motor, motorcyclists being hit by low car drivers, but thankfully it was not a fatality. But also multiple pr properties have been damaged due to low car drivers hitting concrete walls. Our police department also saw a significant increase in felony cases submissions to the Cochise County Attorney's Office from 343 in 2020 to 588 in 2022. The number of felony submissions remained high last year with 531 in 2023. I want to reiterate that this increase does not stem from the violent crime some may fear plague communities near the border, but is largely tied to the surge of incidents related to low car drivers. These incidents tie up a significant amount of time for our police for our police departments that have limited manpower. I grew up in Sierra Vista and graduated from the local high school, Buena High School, Go Colts. I have since raised my family in this extraordinary community. It is a wonderful place to call home, but recently I felt worried about my family members' safety in a way I have never felt before. I have encouraged family members to avoid the major highways that run through town, to stick to local streets because I know these low car drivers pose a very serious threat to their safety. I'm not alone in feeling this way, as many witnesses have, have many has witnessed the reckless driving, dangerous behavior of these drivers, and many others have seen headlines about the damage and harm they have caused. Our law enforcement officers are burning out because they're responding to speeding load cars in our county around the clock. We do not have the resource or the personnel to handle this, su this sustained surge in illegal immigration. This countywide issue has caused co the Cochise County mayors to form a coalition to stand behind our sheriff, police chiefs, and our federal partners in crafting a letter, which I have here, to President Biden describing our issues and noting the critical work that our officers are doing and our deputies are doing in our county to make it safe. We urge you to make securing the U.S. border and supporting our local, county, and federal law enforcement a top priority. Our communities depend on you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary McCaw. I now recognize the Honorable Mark Daniels, Sheriff of Cochise County, for five minutes. Sheriff Daniels. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Tiffany. Sheriff Westerman, my mic is still on. There, I'm back on. And distinguished members here today, welcome to Cochise County. And on behalf of the citizens and my fellow sheriffs, we appreciate you. 
I have served our border communities for 40 years, and prior to that, I served in the U.S. Army Station here in Fort Rechuca. I've worked with all my four major associations in the United States uh, with sheriffs, and we have three major objectives, public safety, national security, and humanitarian. I'm proud of the relationships with all our law enforcement partners, state, local, and federal. We work very well together. I'm proud of our governor, Governor Ducey, Governor Hobbs, who has stood in our corner here in Cochise County to support us in our mission to secure our border and the rule of law. I also want to give a shout out to my citizens here in Cochise County for their patience, their patience, and their patience. They've been through a lot here. To best understand my presentation is to understand where we were three years ago. My county is one of the safest counties based on innovative programs and efforts here and our collective governmental and prioritizations, our messaging, and yes, enforcement efforts supported by the rule of law. The, my citizens and law, enforce, uh, law enforcement, excuse me, address mostly gotaways, fight and flight in my county versus those giving up. Border related crimes at an all time high in Cochise County. Death, murder, investigations, illicit drug poisoning, aggravated acts against my citizens, failure to yield, search and rescue and recovery, and yes, aggravated assaults against our law enforcement officials. My deputies and law enforcement continue to be placed in life-threatening scenarios as the cartels show no regard for citizens and those that wear a badge. Cochise County office detention bookings related to border crimes, just border-related state crimes in calendar year 2022 and 2023. 2,884 people were booked in my jail for border crimes up to murder. 566 smugglers, which is a class two felony, were apprehended and booked in my jail. And that's over a 15 month window. 414 fair to yield high risk pursuits were booked in my jail at a cost of $9.4 million. And I'll just say this to you here, uh, we get zero money from the federal government. Fentanyl continues to poison and kill Americans at an alarming rate, as mentioned by the chairman earlier, leaving families and communities devastated, not just here in Cochise County, but in our great nation. Arizona efforts by law enforcement are remarkable, but the war on drugs must be a priority topic and not deserted uh, by political rhetoric. Arizona fentanyl seizures account for 51% of all the fentanyl seized in the country. Sad to say, in the four border counties, uh, it was 35 million pills two years ago, and that's up this year. In federal fiscal year 2022, Arizona seized over 60 million fentanyl pills. Again, Arizona counties had 35 million, which includes four counties. In closing, my fellow sheriffs and I tried to partner with this administration to include the President of the United States with high hopes to share a collective message, a collective action plan, to support the rule of law, prioritize our southern borders and all our borders, and provide updates for reference community impacts and concerns with no success. To this date, we have not met with the President. That's not one sheriff. By allowing our border security mission and immigration laws to be discretionary, these criminal cartels continue to be the true winners. Their exploitation of mankind is simply modern day slavery, allowing thousands of pounds of illicit drugs in our country that continue to erode the core value of families, schools, and subsequently killing Americans on average 290 per day is completely unacceptable at any level. Experiencing migrant deaths without a reasonable process why Congress, members of Congress, U.S. Congress, and the administration intentionally avoid reality is gross negligence. Our voice of reason has been buried during what I call intellectual avoidance by this administration and, yes, members of U.S. Congress. Communities have been neglected and abandoned, relying on their own local and state resources to address border that is in a crisis mode. Our southern border against all public well-designed statements out of Washington, D.C. is in the worst shape I've ever seen in my 40-year career. When I look at public safety, national security, and the humanitarian on our southern board, border, it has become the largest crime scene in this country. I am a true believer that Customs and Border Patrol are the experts of border security, while sheriffs and police chiefs are the experts of community. Together, this is a recipe of success for all communities and engagement. I will leave you with this final statement. We all serve the priorities of Americans based on our shared oath of offices to keep them safe, enhance their quality of life, and support the rule of law absent political affiliation or the concern of re-election. I ask each one of you to reflect on this statement as you make your decisions to vote. Once again, I thank this committee for the invite and the opportunity, uh, opportunity and now stand ready to answer questions here in a few minutes. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Sheriff Daniels. Appreciate your testimony. I'd now like to recognize Mr. Art Del Cueto, Executive Board Member of the National Border Patrol Council. Mr. Del Cueto, you have five minutes for your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, um, I want to say that I'm a proud uh, individual that grew up in Cochise County, down in Douglas. Go Bulldogs. 
I want to thank everyone for being here today. My name is Art Del Cueto. I am on the executive board of the National Border Patrol Council. It represents the interest of the frontline Border Patrol agents. I am here because what we are doing on the border is not working. Let me provide a few statistics and put the numbers into perspective. Since President Biden took over office in fiscal year 2022 through 20, fiscal year 2023, we've apprehended 6.2 million people along the southwest border. For context, the entire population of the state of Arizona is a little over 7 million. Last year alone, we apprehended almost 2.5 million people illegally entering our country. Of last year's groups, over 35,000 had prior criminal convictions or outstanding warrants for arrests in the United States. Approximately 170 of them were on the terrorist watch list. The number of gotaways is shocking. Since President Biden took over office, we have observed 1.7 million people walk right into this country without being arrested. Those are just what we know of. That is more people, that's, that's more than the people that live in Phoenix, Philadelphia, San Antonio, or Dallas. They walked into this country without being arrested because agents were not available to arrest them. All of this is to say, in the last three years of the Biden administration, we have lost operational control of the border. The drug cartels who control both narcotics and illegal alien smuggling are in control of our southern borders. I want to be clear, this crisis is not just about illegal immigration. The cartels that illegally smuggle migrants into this country are the same ones that are smuggling drugs. Those drugs impact every community nationwide. Over 100,000 Americans have died of overdose in the last year. We will have another 100,000 deaths in 2024 and every year moving forward until we secure our border. And it's not just about the overdose deaths. The murders, muggings, and carjackings that we see on the evening news are largely a byproduct of narcotic trafficking and drug addiction. This violence will not stop until we secure our borders. The question is, are we prepared to do something about it? Winston Churchill once said, Americans always do the right thing, but only after we have exhausted every single option. When it comes to border security, we have exhausted every single option. I know this hearing is about federal lands and how the Biden administration has failed, and they have failed to secure our southern borders. Believe me, I could talk about that all day. However, I do want to use the remaining time to discuss the, the border security supplement that was uh, trying to get proposed through the Senate. I know that it's completely gone and it imploded, but as many of you know, the National Border Patrol Council supported this le legislation, and I would like to explain why. As long as we continue to catch and release tens of thousands of illegal aliens into this country every month, the crisis will not stop. As long as we allow illegals to game our asylum system, it will not stop. As long as we do not provide Border Patrol, ICE, and USCIS, USCIS the resources and legal authorities they need to do this job, they will not stop. The single biggest challenge we face right now is that about every single illegal immigrant arrest claims asylum. They're doing this because they don't, not because they have a valid claim, but because they know that as soon as they do that, they can get released because the capacity is to hold them is not there. And our immigration court system is completely overwhelmed. They know that we will release them and give them a court date upwards of 10 years from now. The Senate legislation would have required asylum officers to screen immigrants for credible fear under a significantly higher standard. This standard was actually piloted under the Trump administration in 2019 and 2020, and that led to about 80% of the illegals failing their credible fear interviews. It also precludes illegal immigrants caught at the border from having access to immigration courts. We would no longer be releasing illegal immigrants with a court date 10 years from now. Asylum officers would have decided and will deport those who fail. Equally important, the legislation provide, would have provided a mandatory trigger for closing the border it does, if the average weekly of, of arrests would have exceeded 5,000. The border would have been automatically closed. It does not say we would have been releasing 5,000. Everyone is sent back to Mexico. If any single arrest level exceeded 8,500, the border would have been closed. Everyone is sent back to Mexico. Gone will be the days of the cartels that would have been flooding and overwhelming the system. No bill is perfect. Are there things that I wish would have been included? Of course. Are there things in the package, such as allowing the administration to continue to parole migrants through the, import, through the ports of entry? I don't like it. Of course I don't like it. However, on this issue, and it's an enormous issue, earlier this week, we arrested over 6,600 illegal immigrants. Over 6,300 of them were released into this country within 48 hours. Tonight, we're gonna apprehend a similar amount, and again, they're going to get released. We need Congress to act now and give us the tools to secure our borders. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Del Cueto, for your testimony. Now I'd like to recognize Mr. John Boltz, the Vice President of the Arizona Farm Bureau. Mr. Boltz, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Tiffany, Chairman Westerhouse, members of the House of Representatives and members of this committee. Thank you for coming to Southern Arizona and good afternoon. I come before you today to thank you for your attention to our man-made crisis at the southern border. Farmers and ranchers in Arizona and neighboring states are in many ways on the front lines of this public policy disaster. And I will mention just a few of those ways in my limited time. Ranchers and their families, employees raising livestock and managing public and private lands in the areas near our border with Mexico face extraordinary challenges with inadequate support from our federal government. The safety of these hardworking people, their families and property is in danger most days and nights due to a lack of law enforcement by federal agencies responsible for border security in these areas. People seeking to enter our country without passing through a legal port of entry are breaking federal law. The damage these people do to the public and private lands while entering unlawfully is unacceptable and the refuse they leave behind is remarkable. It is, is it too much to ask that ranchers of Southern Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas be able to raise their livestock and families without being overrun by illegal immigrants and drug runners? Where I live in Yuma County, my neighbors and I grow fresh produce such as lettuce, spinach, melons, broccoli, and cauliflower in season this time of year. And the, the food that we're growing is mostly eaten raw by people all over the United States and Canada. We have nearly 50,000 people working in agriculture in my small community, of which 8,000 workers are H-2A workers, over 15,000 are commuter workers who travel into the U.S. daily to work and return to Mexico each night, and the rest of the workforce is comprised of citizens, naturalized citizens, permanent resident card holders. Our workforce in Yuma County is legal, and we have an abundance of legal commerce and activity in my community that is happening daily. That is the backdrop to the mess that we observed since December 2020. It's really been going on for decades, but it's been particularly egregious since around December 2020. We have individuals and families numbering in the thousands entering our country through areas that are not ports of entry on a daily basis. This humanitarian cri crisis is happening along our county roads and rural areas of my county, just like it is in the rest of the lands across our southern border. We face unique challenges having food crops of the kind that are normally eaten raw growing in open fields. We can't have trespassers entering those fields passing through these fields, leaving garbage in these fields, or even worse, defecating or urinating in or near these fields. These fresh produce crops are unharvestable if they're exposed to these sort of risks of contamination from human pathogens, and if they're contaminated in any way, just simply not usable. Huge waste of natural resources, energy, money. It's been a very commonplace situation the last few years, especially in farmland, about 40,000 acres that's very close to our southern border. And this poses an enormous liability risk and financial hardship to farmers and fresh produce shippers. And it impacts our domestically grown food supply in a big way. Is it too much to ask that farmers of southern Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas be able to raise their crops without being overrun by illegal immigrants and drug runners? I don't think it is. Requiring asylum seekers to seek legal status to immigrate at a consulate of the U.S. State Department and to have robust enforcement of our laws at the border would restore safety and, envir and an environment only conducive to legal commerce in our border regions. We have been facing an extraordinary level of illegal entries into the United States along our southern border these last few years. 371,000 36 encounters were dealt with by Customs and Border Protection just in December of 2023. I'll close by calling upon all of you, the members of Congress here and your colleagues back in D.C. and this administration to act and act swiftly to address the crisis we have at the border. It is time to act and put forth meaningful policies that address the problem and give our border communities, law enforcement, and the families that live along this border a reprieve. 
This is not and should not be a political issue. It is time to put partisan politics aside and solve our border crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boltz. I'd like to recognize Mr. James Chilton, the ranch owner from Aravaca, Arizona. Mr. Chilton, good to have you back before the committee. You have five minutes. My name is Jim Chilton. I'm a fifth generation Arizona rancher from Aravaca, Arizona, a small town of approximately 55 miles southwest of Tucson. The ranch includes private property, state school trust lands, and federal grazing permits in the Coronado National Forest. My ancestors drove cattle from Texas to Arizona Territory in 1885, and our family has been in the ranching business in Arizona for about 139 years. My border concerns are similar to those of most ranchers in the Tucson sector, regardless of whether their ranch is located adjacent to the international border uh, or uh, 100 miles inside the border. The ranch is roughly 50,000 acres, and uh, the image that uh, Chairman Tiffany showed of this uh, camp uh, is adjacent to our ranch. Our ranch has an exposure of about 14 miles to the international boundary, and the wall crept out from the west, east, and was stopped by President Biden on his first day in office. Do I, are we going to show the uh, film? Okay, thank you. For about 10 years, I have collected film from hidden motion activated cameras of drug packers, previously deported persons, and illegal crossers through our ranch. Of approximately 100 trails traversing our ranch, only five cam we have only five cameras. So these video images are a small sample of the persons entering through our ranch. Since January 2021, these cameras have recorded 3,050 images of unlawful border crossers. My testimony today hopefully uh, can be uh, given on a thumb drive to each uh, Congress member. For the record, it's hard evidence. These filmed border crossers, as you can see, are wearing camouflage clothes, carpet shoes, and have almost identical pack backpacks. This is in stark contrast to other border crossers reported in the news along the international boundary in Arizona, California, and Texas, who wear casual street clothes and include women and or children. There, have, there are no images on my cameras for the last decade of any women with children. On the south end of the ranch, uh, which is five and a half miles of the international border, uh, there are now large numbers of people coming across who are uh, women and children, and they walk towards the uh, no more deaths camp that you showed uh, on your uh, opening statement. <clears throat> Most critically, are any of the 3,050 terrorists, not knowing who is crossing is a national security matter. The video documents a five-fold increase compared to what we we're documenting on average during the Trump and Obama years. Mexican cartel scouts occupying our mountaintops guide these border crossers. During the last four months, I have not seen a single border patrol agent patrolling these non-border entrance trails since most agents are totally overwhelmed 
processing undocumented migrants. Please refer to my testimony for my specific recommendations for securing the border at the border. We've got to secure the border at the border. Thank you, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chilton, thank you for your testimony. And now, um, members of the dais, we are going to take five minutes for each of you uh, for questioning. And I am going to start out, and I'm gonna start out with you, Mr. Chilton. Um, so is it accurate, we talked about the environmental degradation, the garbage, the pollution that is out there on lands here, including federal lands in southern Arizona. Um, is that accurate that um, this is, problem has been getting worse? It's been, been getting worse. It's an environmental degradation. Um, witness Del Cuento stated that there have been millions of people apprehended. Bottom line, if you have three million people coming across the border at eight and a half pounds of garbage apiece, that's uh, 12,500 tons of trash. I get very tired of riding through my ranch and seeing and observing uh, trash left by these crossers. So you've seen a massive increase over the last couple of decades, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, I want to turn to you. Um, uh, you mentioned about social media, about how they use that to be able to um, facilitate this, these illegal crossings. Yes, sir. So, so we have a federal law that um, uh, um, prevents someone from breaking the law. So in other words, a, let's say you took out an ad in a newspaper and you said, hey, drive your car down to uh, the southern border and you can pick up a bunch of people that are hauling fentanyl. Um, that would be illegal under federal law. Do you think that law should be enforced in regards to the social media companies? Chairman Tiffany, um, yes sir, I, I definitely do. Um, and the sheriff can talk for days on this one. Um, that is how these low car drivers get their, get their marching orders. Um, they, get, they get a text, they get a, a, a phone call, meet here, um, the car station at probably Walmart or Target, um, keys are on the on the tire. Pick up the car, drive south. Pick up the load, drive north. Yeah. So um, we had a vice president from Microsoft say that um, I, I believe it was it was one of the social media companies that said that um, yeah um, our platform gets used to be able to facilitate these illegal crossings. I think it's about time that the social media companies um, who are quick to censor some people that they do their job to prevent these illegal um, transactions from going on. Sheriff Daniels, I wanna talk about fentanyl for just a second. Um, what's the biggest action, what's the most significant action that happened over the last few years that has led to increased fentanyl coming into the United States of America? Well, Mr. Chairman, let me just say this. The biggest thing is when we deferred our Border Patrol, which is a frontline agents on the line, and put them in processing and other duties assigned. You shut down the checkpoints. You shut down a lot of your aerostats along the border. Long story, I call it the infrastructure fracture when it comes to the CBP. You've opened up the border. And the more agents you take off the border, the more opportunities. The cartels are the true winners in this, and they are exploiting our borders with fentanyl. So in other words, Sheriff, on January 20th of 2021, when President Biden, in effect, declared open borders, um, that is largely what precipitated this massive increase of fentanyl coming into our country, is that right? Yes, I would agree. Yeah, and I cited, I stopped today at a Border Patrol checkpoint. It has not been manned for a long time, and it's not the fault of the Border Patrol. It's no. because they're being babysitters at this point. It's terribly unfortunate. And, uh, and by the way, um, I asked Secretary Mayorkas in a hearing. I sit on the Judiciary Committee. Sheriff Daniels was there in Washington, D.C. He cited the same exact testimony. It has not changed in the three times I've asked Sheriff Daniels this question. And I asked, who's uh, not telling the truth? Because Secretary Mayorkas said to us, no, it, um, the actions of January 20th of 2021 are not the reason why fentanyl has increased the way it has. I said, who's lying, the sheriff or you? 
Of course he would not go after Sheriff Daniels because he is above repute amongst not just local citizens here in Arizona, but amongst the people of the United States who have worked with him. Secretary Mayorkas was not telling us the truth. The final thing I'd say uh, in my closing couple seconds is I really appreciate the testimony of Mr. Del Cueto and I understand why the position that the Border Patrol took in regards to the bill that was released by the Senate. But I just point out a couple things to you in regards to the Senate bill. The President can declare an emergency under that bill at any time and have open borders. Do you think for a second the current President would not declare an emergency and allow open borders to happen? Furthermore, the lead author, one of the lead authors said over the past weekend, under that bill, the border never closes. And went on to say that um, just today, that our priority, not American citizens, our priority is not American citizens, it is the people who are in here illegally. I now recognize the chairman, Mr. Westerman, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Tiffany, and thank you again to the witnesses for being here. Uh, read all of your testimony and I appreciate the time and the effort that you put into it and the uh, information that we were able to get from your testimony. Sheriff Daniels, we got a briefing from you this morning and in your testimony you talked about the $9.4 million, um, but you, you had another stat that you didn't say today, but you said this morning that wasn't in your testimony about nationwide, I believe you said a half billion dollars of cost have been incurred by local law enforcement because of the failure to secure the border. Could you elaborate on that? I, I can. It's called SCAPS, or SCAP State Criminal Alien Assistance Program, which all is money allocated by the federal government, you all, Congress, that's to help local and state jurisdictions offset costs for those that are incarcerated that are legally in the country. Since 2009, Arizona, the 15 Arizona sheriffs are owed over half a billion dollars by you all, and we'd like to have our money. But I'm just, the, uh, it's, we get about five cents to the dollar on SCAP right now, which has been ineffective to house, especially in a crisis over the last three years. Thanks to the state of Arizona and the two governors I mentioned, Governor Ducey and Governor Hobbs, and the money we've set aside for our programs, they're helping us offset those costs that otherwise my citizens here in Cochise County would have absorbed. And Mr. Del Coito, um, as I mentioned, it's uh, been a few years back, I made my first trip to the Arizona border. Uh, I saw the, we did a lot of, uh, spent a lot of time out on the ground. I saw the piles of trash, the camouflage clothes, the carpet covered shoes, the backpacks, the water bottles, all the trash that was discarded. And I saw firsthand how the uh, uh, people coming across the border were avoiding um, Customs and Border Patrol that they had lookouts out in the, the mountains radioing down. I've visited many other places along the border. In Texas, it's a whole different story. You see people in plain clothes walking up and it's almost like they finished the marathon when they see the Border Patrol agent. That's who they're looking for. They want to turn themselves in and claim asylum. So with everything that's happened with the mass numbers in Texas, it appears that's where all the, the crossings are happening, but on our visit this morning, your, your colleague told us that in 2020, there were 60,000 apprehensions in the Tucson se sector. Today, there's 10 times more than that. Um, I was shocked to, to learn that, even with more wall being built, more access along the border, and these are people that are trying to avoid getting caught that come across this sector. Uh, what do you think caused the increase here and, and why is that not being focused on more than the, the masses that are crossing in Texas and, and it should be, it's a, it's a tragedy everywhere it's happening. So, so it's the lack of consequences from this administration. Um, they realize that if they cross, they just have to claim asylum and they get released. So what's been happening in Arizona is you're still having the large groups that are coming through here uh, and they're in more remote areas. So the drive from when agents arrest these individuals to an area of processing is sometimes uh, you know, well over uh, one hour or two hours away. And I think that's some of the issues. So that's two hours where the agent is now away from the line 
that allows the drug smugglers to start bringing their drugs and everything else into the country. Uh, now, uh, the realistically, you're seeing a lot more focus in Texas because the governor in Texas has done a fantastic job of allowing the media and allowing uh, having other law enforcement in those areas that are able to talk about it and see what the problem is. Uh, out here in Arizona, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a little bit uh, harder for individuals to see what is happening. Uh, and I can tell you specifically, I think it's approximately right over 60 linear miles with Mexico. Uh, and it's very limited access to uh, media or anyone else to go out there. As an example, when you are seeing you know, the mass groups that were coming in, in in Texas or in areas of Lukeville, at the same time, that area, uh, particularly an area called the San Miguel Gate, was experiencing over a thousand individuals that were entering every single morning. And all they had in that area was two agents to watch over a thousand people. Thank you, um, Mayor. I, I was shocked in your testimony. You're the mayor. You grew up here, and you actually advised your family to stay off the main thoroughfares. We're almost out of time, but I can only imagine what it's like if you used to recreate on the federal lands here, how much of a discouragement it would be to, to use the public lands. And to our ranchers and farmers, thank you for what you do. Much of what our committee works on deals with rural America. Uh, I'll leave you with a, a quote by uh, a famous writer named Aldo Leopold, he said, there are two great spiritual dangers of not living on a farm. The first is when you think food comes from the grocery, and the second is when you think heat comes from the furnace. I know it's hard to get young people to go into farming today, into ranching, and it makes it exponentially more difficult when you're in an area dealing with the things you're dealing with with the border crisis. So thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields. Um, um, I, I want to correct one statement. I want to make sure that I gave in, uh, earlier I attributed a quote, which was to Senator Murphy, who was one of the authors of the um, Senate bill. And uh, I want to be precise in what he said. He said, our, uh, uh, our strategy has failed to deliver for the people we care about most, the undocumented Americans that are in this country. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Curtis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I have reflected, um, waiting for my turn, I don't want to be too uh, dramatic, but this just may be the most important hearing that I've attended in my seven years in Congress. If you think about 100,000 lives lost to fentanyl, if you think about the, the many impacts that we've talked about today, this is incredibly important, and I hope the American people are watching. This is my third trip to the border in, uh, in, in several years. I've been under a, a President Trump's administration and President uh, Biden's administration. And I came today with a specific purpose to learn about the control of the border. And what I learned is that the border is controlled, not by the US government, but by the cartels. They control who comes, they control when they come, and where they come into the United States. I thought that was our job in the United States. They even control if they come. I was shocked to learn that if those who want to cross the border aren't willing to pay the thousands and thousands of dollars, that they could be shot by the cartel coming across the border. Every fact here points to the complete failure of President Biden and his policies, or perhaps a better way to describe it is lack of policies. As just one example, as we arrived at the border today, we were greeted by a wall, almost as far as I could see. Imagine my surprise to learn that that was President Obama's wall, the 20-foot wall. Towards the end of the wall, you could see where it climbed to 30 feet, President Trump's wall, and then symbolically after that, no wall, representing no policies, no effort, no ability to deal with what's happening here. And of course, the, the piles and piles and piles of unconstructed wall laid on the ground uh, next to the wall. Sheriff, it was quoted earlier, but I, I wanna restate this because all of us were impacted by this. You said, we're not dealing with an immigration issue. We are dealing with an, with an organized crime issue. Could you explain that a little bit so that everybody else can understand what you meant by that? Well, Congressman, we're dealing with an issue where the border, our southern border, and northern border, let's not be absent to that, is controlled ingre ingress and degress by these criminal cartels for violence, fear, and greed. There's just no other way around it. CBP knows it, 
locals know it, law enforcement knows it, we see it every day. And to talk with my fellow sheriffs, the crime, the tragedies uh, that they're bringing to our country, not just now the borders, this is America's problem. Uh, the criminal cartels, these organized transnational organizations are destroying our country, one pill at a time, one entry at a time. We talk about the millions of crossings. Is it fair to say that at, at the low numbers, people are paying five, $6,000 per crossing? That is correct. And those are the low numbers. Um, the, the higher countries of interest, the higher the price goes. We've seen it all the way up to 21,000 and plus. Thank you. Um, Mr. Del Cudo, um, tell me why Utahns should care. We live. Uh, tell me why Utahns should care about what's happening here. We live a long ways away from this, but can you help Utahns understand why this impacts them and how this impacts them? Because uh, the, the drug cartels are not just operating here. Uh, they're not just making their money off of what they sell on our southern border or in border states. They're making their money off of what they sell throughout the entire country. And you know, when you're looking at what is being apprehended or where these individuals are being apprehended, it is known that uh, the drug cartels operate in over 160 different countries worldwide. And because of that, they are going to continue to operate in different states within the United States, including Utah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, our fentanyl deaths in, in our state have increased dramatically uh, in correspondence with the numbers uh, coming across uh, the border. Mayor, I was a mayor of Provo, Utah for eight years. <laughs> and uh, listen, I think anybody that's a mayor walks on water, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. You, uh, do you have any sense, I, I can't imagine financially how you budget uh, for the impact of this. Do you have any sense how this impacts your budget? Sir, um, my police chief, was, the deputy chief is here. Um, do, when we have low cars come through town, um, we don't have, we have 66 sworn, uh, but all those 66 sworn are, are, are sectioned out when we have a low car come through town um, because we don't know when they're coming, um, where they're coming. Um, the sheriff does a, and the deputies does an amazing job of trying to keep the low cars out of town. But um, some come through town, and then and we have to we have to man all posts um, because we have a lot of intersections. We have a lot a lot of families. Matter of fact, one one um, little car came um, came down to our high school, which we have to lock down the high school, have to lock down the schools, so that takes us our way out. Of resources. I, and, I, and, and we're out of time, but I can't even imagine. That's one aspect of it. Health care, right? Every every aspect of this has to be impact your budget. Yes, sir. Let me just say quickly. I've introduced uh, recently into the House a bill that it would actually reimburse states who send law enforcement help to Texas. And uh, we hear you loud and clear uh, that you can't afford this. And, and I certainly, with my colleagues, will look for ways to get you help. Mr. Chairman, I yield my time. Yeah, thank you for your questions, Mr. Curtis. Now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for holding this uh, important hearing. And Representative uh, Siskamani, uh, thanks for having us down here. Uh, your staff is uh, doing a great job. And, um, so we talk about the southern border. Um, what's happening at the southern border also affects the northern border. I represent northeastern Minnesota, so if you look on a map, the farthest right of uh, eastern part of Minnesota, almost to that little notch and beyond. Um, and then that's the Grand Fork sector, and you know that, uh, Mr. Tequeno. There's two agents on duty tonight, two in over 500 miles. Do you know why? because they're down here processing or they're in their offices in the day in processing for, for what's happening down here. So we have, we have two borders, folks. Uh, and I, this is my third time as well coming down here and, and I'll just share with you that uh, and, uh, uh, a terrorist on the watch list got through uh, the border of California, ended up in Minnesota, was there for almost a year before uh, we realized that he was on the terror watch list and uh, took him into custody. But in that eight or nine months, it's alleged he was involved in arms sales. And then when you talk about the 1.7 million gotaways, 1.7 million gotaways. I want to remind the people that it took 19 terrorists <clears throat> to do that bastardly attack, 9-11. We have one, we have, don't know who they are, where they went, and what their intentions are. And that doesn't count the 85,000 children. We don't know what's, where they are. 
And to the men and women in law enforcement who are wearing the uniform today in plain clothes, we thank you from the bottom of our heart for what you're doing. As one of only a few members in Congress that have ever worn the uniform, I have a good idea what you're going through. And Sheriff, when, you're, when your folks are chasing, that's the most dangerous thing they can do. But the men and women put their lives on the line for the safety of us. Representative Fishback, myself, the re and the re uh, other Minnesota delegation, we sent a letter uh, to Mayorkas, and I want to uh, asking how did that terrorist get into the state of Minnesota? And, I, and Mr. Chair, I want to uh, uh, put that in the record, if I may. Without objection. Uh, Sheriff Daniels, uh, first off, you, this is the first time you and I met. Correct. Um, you are impressive. Uh, Thank you. Your service, um, you, your um, get it done attitude, and your truthfulness. Um, and uh, I am appalled that as a, as, as a leader, uh, a law enforcement leader in this county, that you have not re uh, received a, uh, a response from our president, from the National Sheriff's Association, to meet with him. That is appalling. It is. Sheriff Daniels, can you elaborate on any instances of red tape, whether it be permitting challenges or otherwise that is holding back your department from taking necessary action or making necessary investments to better respond to this border crisis? Yes, and thank you for the fine comments. Thank you, I'm, I'm humbled. L let me say this, and, and we've, we've presented a 16-point action plan to Secretary Mayorkas. I actually hand-carried that to him, accompanied by about 10 other sheriffs. Three months later, four months later, where the estimated time was, I asked him where we were at with that 16-point action plan, which was put together by nation sheriffs uh, around the country. He stated to me, did you give me something, Sheriff? We've never heard back since. We have sent a minimum of four letters to the White House to meet President Biden on behalf of the four major county sheriff association with no response. And that's been reconfirmed over and over to meet with us. This is the first president in modern day history not to meet with one sheriff in this country. We call that insulting. The other thing that's really hurting us is the failure to prioritize our southern border by this administration, the failure to follow the rule of law, the fa failure to have judicial oversight, and most important is the failure to have our CBP agents working alongside us because they've been redeployed for other administrative duties. We need our agents back and our officers back from the federal government and to do and be allowed to do their job. Totally agreed. Uh, Mr. Boltz, uh, Mr. Uh, Chilton, thanks for your testimony. I've only got 20 seconds left. Mr. Chilton, with the, the, uh, the number of people crossing uh, your lands and, and uh, uh, wreaking havoc on your crops and the garbage, what does it cost you personally? We've tried to answer that question, and it costs me personally about sixty thousand dollars a year. Six, is that was that sixty six, sixty thousand dollars a year? But the real cost is uh, the concern that my cowboys and my family might be uh, violated, get caught get caught between border patrol and. Uh, the illegals uh, in a gunfight. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, can I you indulge me for 30 more seconds? Um, this president today, without any legislation, by executive action, can end catch and release, reinstate, remain in Mexico, enter into asylum cooperative agreements, end parole abusers, detain in inadmissible aliens, use expedited removal, rein in taxpayer-funded benefits for illegal aliens, and issue a proclamation to suspend or restrict entry. This is the exact same thing that Chairman uh, Westerman just said. He can do that in five minutes by executive order, and I yield back. Uh, I believe the gentleman from Minnesota directed the question to both Mr. Chilton and Mr. Boltz. Mr. Boltz, do you want to address that question of the cost to your operation as a result of illegal immigration? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Stauber, um, myself and my neighbors, it costs uh, those of us operating the roughly 40,000 acres that are closest to our international boundary anywhere from a couple hundred thousand a year in cleanup uh, to several million dollars a year 
It just depends. Uh, we had a unique situation where a whole group of Haitian immigrants um, who were a little bit unique compared to most um, immigrants and asylum seekers, folks entering the country illegally, they camped out alongside one of our fresh produce fields, one of my neighbors, and stayed there for a couple of days. They were unique in that they weren't walking across the border and saying, here I am, where's my free bus ticket, my free meal ticket, uh, my free airline ticket in my hotel room. Um, they were less trusting of um, federal and local authorities, so they camped out for a couple of days, mostly women and children. Um, you don't want people sitting next to your fresh produce field um, who you can't get to leave. Uh, so that was a unique situation, but yeah, uh, unbelievable quantity of trash, uh, refuse, trampling of crops. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. And the worst part about it is most of the folks that I mentioned in my testimony um, that work, uh, legally work in agricultural fields in my community, um, the first and second generation immigrants, uh, ask them what they think about what's going on today. It, they are appalled. These are people that spent tens of thousands of their own hard-earned dollars, sometimes it impacted multiple generations, and they sit there and work every day and watch our government. They worked hard to become part of this country, a legal part of this country. Uh, they passed through uh, checkpoints, they passed through ports of entry, they did it legally, and uh, they are extremely appalled. Many of them are the ones out here picking up the trash, refuse, and trying to make use of the crops uh, behind uh, this tragedy. Now I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Guam, Mr. Moylan, for his questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you everyone for being here today to participate in this very important hearing. I just want to expand a little bit more on talking on the financial side of this impact we're seeing from these influx of migrants. Now my, my district is from Guam, and it's not as impacted exactly as the issues you are facing, facing, but my constituents know all too well the feeling of being left to deal with a large number of migrants without adequate financing uh, support from the federal government. So my first question is for Mayor McCaw. Uh, thank you for ex your uh, extensive Army service, sir, by the way. Thank you. And for coming today to discuss how your community has been impacted by this migrant crisis. You mentioned some of the numbers, but I just really want you to expand and help us see it even clearer. The impact that your local town budget that you're using to provide the services, such as police and fire and hospitalization, for, that is being taken away from your residents. This money has been taken away from your budget. What's being neglected? How, are, how can you continue on this way without the federal government coming in and giving you that support? Chairman Tiffany, Representative Mullen, um, thank you, sir. Our budget is being impacted. We have our CEO of the hospital. He's, he's, in, the, he's in the room as well. Um, he had said that there, we have our hospitals are, are, are overcrowded. Um, the emergency rooms are overcrowded. Um, the, our resources, police, again, our police resources, we only have 66 warrant, um, but when low cars come, down, come through town, again, um, every sworn um, d detectives, even our own deputy chief have to go out on the, on the road. That, that takes away from our citizens. Um, that takes away from our communities. Um, our budget, I don't have, the, I don't have the, the hard numbers, but I can get those to you um, after, after this is concluded. Um, that, that, that's fine. I'm actually thinking, what are you, are you having to neglect basic services for your residents because of the lack of budget or the amount of budget that you have to use in order to provide these services to these illegal migrants? Yes, sir. For example, what are the things that are being neglected? Uh, just, just regular patrols around town, sir. Regular patrols that, that keeps our community safe. Sure, if you want to you wanna add on that? Yeah, if I, if I could add to put a collective statement on that, under the, just the jail bookings that I shared earlier, three year, over three years ago, our percentage of border-related crimes in our jail estimated were five to 10%. We're pushing 44% of all the crime in our jail was border-related. That's a collective statement to every community in, in this county for law enforcement. That's what they're addressing in their communities too, it's relevant. How's your retention rate with your officers? And it's getting a new recruits as well. I, I'm sorry, Congressman. Yeah, it's it's a serious challenge because we spend you can almost figure 40 to 45 percent of our time dealing with some kind of border crime. We were when you guys were at the um, border down there. I got back in my car and there were 
uh, looking for a, a load vehicle as you were sitting on the border. We deal with it all day long, whether it's a death, whether it's a tragedy, whether it's a high risk pursuit, we're dealing with it. And let me just say it hasn't been discussed. I think it's really important if I uh, get the privilege on this is the threats toward law enforcement. I had, I've seen agents where they're, they try to cut their throats. I, I've seen troopers drugged by smuggler drivers. I had two deputies almost killed last year. One is still off the job and I'm sitting there at the hospital where they, they didn't think he was gonna live from an incident from a low driver going 100 miles an hour. Are we sick of it? Yeah, we're real sick of it. We're sick of it and we're asking for answers. But these officers, these deputies, these agents, and these troopers are putting their lives on the line and thank you all for supporting that. Thank you, sir, for what you said on that. We're in the badge with us. So we need your help on that. I'd be happy to help, but I just wish our president would be more involved in this. You expressed some dangerous situations going on here. Are you pleading for help? You have the facts in front of you. But yet, I don't understand why the Biden administration hasn't taken the time to come and stand by your side and do what's right. And just to add on that, I was on behalf of national sheriffs on President Biden's transition team on behalf of sheriffs, national sheriffs. I shared the stories and the good efforts that we're doing, the reality of our conversation. I was shocked, disappointed, and again frustrated that on day one, the first week, he declared the southwest border a non-emergency, which puts us in this position even worse than we've ever seen it. It is frustrating. I spoke to the White House, Tom Perez, uh, along with four other sheriffs just recently. I begged for a meeting with the national sheriff's leadership, and it's been crickets ever since. I thank you for your service. And thank you. to the rest of the panel and those coming here today. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman yields. I'd like to recognize Mr. LaMalfa from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your gathering here today for us to be able to interact with you. I've made a couple of trips to the border, and today just underlines how futile what we're doing or what this federal government is doing is. It's appalling. And my wish is not to politicize this per se, but for President Biden to come on the TV and say, well, the Republicans could have been doing something about this hogwash. I mean, they held all three branches for, uh, from 2000 to 22. They could have done anything they want on the Democrat side with their dominance. Any legislation they wanted, they could have done it, all right? And so they did not act. Instead, they opened the gates even wider. And so to blame, you know, and I, nobody wants to hear this partisan stuff, I get it. But you have to lay the, lay the problem where it is. So um, for, for us to be uh, taking up this situation with Secretary Mayorkas, a lot of people say, oh, it's just a political stunt. You're going to impeach this guy, right? He's earned it, okay? He has lied to the public. He's lied to Congress. He has not done his job. No, maybe, it, you know, what rolls downhill. Maybe the orders are coming from the top. But he could do honorable things and either speak against it or resign himself if he finds what's going on, what his orders are so abhorrent. So we'll be doing that again this coming week, and maybe we can get our act together and actually see that through and make the statement on that and hold him, hold him accountable. That's what it's about. It's not a political stunt. So with that, I'm a farmer in Northern California in my real life, and um, I wanted to ask a couple questions of Mr. Boltz and one of Mr. Chilton as well. Mr. Chilton, let me start with you. Again, we were out there a minute ago uh, looking at the fence line there and all that material, all that fence material that we've paid millions and millions of dollars for, it, a lot of them have date codes on it. They're like from October or November of 2020 that material's been laying there. And so did I not hear there was a, a situation for a while where people with private property right up against the border, there was folks helping fund and put up fence on private lands and the ability to do that. Mr. Shilton, was that something that was offered to you or available to you or has that since been tossed out by a court or something? Do you have that availability of somebody building privately and you know giving the funding to uh, fence off your land? The, f the five and a half miles of international border on my ranch yes, sir. Uh, is all federal land. The problem is, is they cross federal land and then cross my private property. Um, private people have a difficult time getting the approval of the federal government to put in walls. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, I knew it was going to be tough. Well, we still have these gaps in it, and we couldn't see them all where we were, but we know about them on a previous trip down to the Yuma area. You could see the gaps. It's ridiculous. People just streaming across. Biden promised about two years ago, we're going to fill in the gaps. I guess they've done a little bit of it now, but it's ridiculous. Um, Mr. Boltz, um, when you're talking about the people trampling through the fields there, I'd like to give you more time to emphasize on what the losses are on that because, you know, in California we implemented very tough uh, phytotoxicity rules on, on the leafy green crops and such. They, they can't get anything on them. You know, they're even talking about putting, they, they've talked about screening over orchards there so if birds are flying over, you don't get bird feces on the fruit and stuff like that. I mean, they, they don't live in the real world sometimes, but what do you have to deal with as far as uh, um, the cost, the other preventative measures, because they're out there anyway in order to protect your crops and get your crops so they can pass uh, health and food inspection to get them to market? And the, what, what, is, what is the cost to your industry? Mr. Chairman, Representative LaMalfa, um, yeah, it is an extraordinary situation. Um, basically, if we have any animal or any human being, these are you know, where pathogens come from, right? Uh, human pathogens are carried by people and they're, they're carried by wildlife uh, and domesticated animals. So uh, we're very cognizant of it. Um, we're evaluating fields before they're planted, uh, at planting, uh, during the growing of the crop, we're especially uh, uh, attentive. And then uh, right immediately prior to harvest, evaluations happen um, on a field by field basis. Uh, roughly an, an acre of uh, a fresh produce can be worth five to six thousand dollars before a knife is put to it and it's harvested. Um, so we're obviously trying to make the best use that we can of uh, of. What are we are have you to talking work. for your industries? Like we're are we talking tens of millions in losses? Are farmers looking at what they're dealing with there and saying maybe I'm just not going to plant these particular crops by the border? Is that those, that's a, sort of things? There are definitely some lands that are not put into fresh vegetable production. They're left in other crops for that specific reason. Uh, there's fencing going in. Uh, there's crop lost every year because of being not just physically trampled, but just when folks that are not properly trained enter a field, um, you have to section off that area of the field. Um, it's an ongoing issue. Our particular issue is largest um, in the very western part of our county uh, on or near uh, the Kokopah uh, Reservation. Um, there's no fencing on the Kokopah Reservation. That's a unique situation that uh, really our, our State Department, uh, the Kokopah Tribe, it's not just a problem for us farmers that are farming Kokopah land. Uh, it's an extraordinary problem for the Border Patrol. There's concentration of their uh, resources dedicated there because of uh, there being no wall. Um, there is some Normandy fencing, uh, but even that has been penetrated with vehicles running uh, people and, uh, and smuggling drugs. So okay, it's an extraordinary you. problem. Uh, it's been going on for decades. Okay, thank you. If you're not growing it here, and I'm not growing it in the Central Valley because they're taking the water away and giving it to fish, or in my district where the marijuana cartels, because of the border, are making water and land unusable, we got a gigantic problem. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair now recognizes a gentleman from Oklahoma uh, who is also the chairman of the House Republican Study Committee. Mr. Hearn, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, but I really want to recognize uh, your new congressman, uh, Congressman Siscomani. He's done a fantastic job for you all representing this most important issue in Congress to us all. I often say, and I said this earlier this morning, there's a lot of people in Congress that talk about things they know nothing about. It's wonderful to have somebody there that actually has lived it and seen it in his entire life. So thank you, one. Thank you, my friend. You know, we're, uh, you're hearing us all, and we're, we're so, it's such, so great for us to be here and be able to vent to people that live this every single day. And I know in your hearts, in your mind, you're saying they're here. What are they going to do? Um, we're on your side, and it's like this is almost like us just talking to each other, and it's so great. You have a great sheriff here. It was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, our law enforcement, it, it's so refreshing across the country, and I want you to know that he's backed by county sheriffs across this nation. Um, I, I just had a roundtable this past week in, in my district back in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and this same narrative is it's everywhere. Congressman, what are we going to do about the southern border? We have fentanyl issues. It's killing our people, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's a travesty. we got human trafficking. 
uh, uh, Homeland Investigation Services are just turning people loose. Uh, they're not letting us r arrest people. And, and so this, unfortunately, Mr. Boltz, I, I think you said this earlier, it shouldn't be a partisan issue, but it is. And it's sad. Uh, it's not a partisan issue to go through that pre-check line in, at the airport and make sure there's not criminals when you got, you're sitting next side, beside somebody. But you all, every single day, are living the same kind of threat in your towns, your communities, your homes. Many of us up here have been to the southern border numerous times in Texas. It gets the most highlight. But as the, um, as the CBP uh, chief said a minute ago, we're seven times, eight times worse than that any place on the Texas border. It's a travesty what's gone on across this nation's southern border, a travesty. You know, we saw an article, and, and I think more and more people, um, I think we can thank Governor Abbott for what he has done to send uh, or allow people to leave Texas and go to these sanctuary cities because now you have our colleagues on the other side of the aisle that are putting pressure on this. And in Washington, D.C., there's nothing more impactful than politics. And the president knows that there's a real problem now, and he's trying to figure out how to do it. And you heard the, my colleagues talk about the eight items out there. I would love, Sheriff, or anybody up here, if of those eight items, which would have the biggest impact on the invasion across our southern border. And, and before you answer that, I just want to say one thing. If you haven't seen how the, the people now are starting to report this, if you saw 60 Minutes on Sunday night talk about uh, what was happening 60 miles east of San Diego, where TikTok was instructing people around the world on how to come to this particular point, something as similar as the end of the wall that we just saw out here just a minute ago, just droves of them. And Chinese, Chinese, and CBS 60 Minutes reported there were 600 Chinese illegal immigrants came across that, that one hole in the wall in a three-day period. And TikTok instructed them how to do that, how to bring them 7,000 miles away so, Sheriff, if you could talk to us about the eight items, uh, which one of those that the president could implement quickly and with what impact it would have. Well, the biggest thing I would say is this, and I've said this for the last several years, is you got to acknowledge there's a problem. And we just finally heard that several weeks ago from President Biden that the border is not secured. We have the vice president, the border czar, that has not engaged with the border communities, uh, mayors, sheriffs, and beyond. So he's acknowledged it. Now let's prioritize it. Let's engage our community leaders to get to the table, and we can fix it. At the beginning of the day, it wakes up with the community. At the end of the day, we go to bed with communities. But the more you neglect communities, the worse this is going to get. And, I'll, uh, and then you prioritize and enforce the rule of law. And I got to say one last thing I think is so important that Secretary Mayorkas and I spoke about three years ago. I said we have to have enhanced judicial oversight on credible fear uh, asylum claims because right now they're exploiting it. He said, I 100% agree with you, Sheriff. That was three years ago. We're nowhere different than we were three years ago. Uh, I'll leave it at that. If you saw what the President said today, which proves what my colleagues have said, nothing has changed since President Trump was in office. The thing that's changed is that President Biden has undone all the things that President Trump did that started slowing the, the crossings of the border. He said today that since Congress can't do something, I guess I'm going to have to implement executive orders. So he's known all along that he's had the ability to do this and that they've been discussing this for months. And there have been people dying across this country because of illegal fentanyl flowing, and you all have been suffering. So I just want you to know those are the facts. And he, he was the one to put that out today, that he was going to have to do executive orders. I yield back. Gentleman yields. I'd now like to recognize the gentle lady from Wyoming, Ms. Hageman. Thank you. Mr. Boltz, I had the pleasure of visiting the Yuma area last year, although unfortunately it was for the purpose of understanding the scope of this crisis. I want to discuss how the current failure to defend federal borderlands and secure the southern border is impacting you, and I want to focus on the impact it has on Yuma agriculture. It, I was incredibly fascinated to learn that between November and March, as much as 90 percent of our nation's leafy vegetables like lettuce are grown in Yuma. Mr. Boltz, you touch on this in your testimony, but I want to give you more time to discuss the burden individuals crossing through non-ports of entry has on agriculture in your community. What does this do for crop production? What I specifically would like to get to is, can crossings through your fields result in mandatory significant crop destruction? 
Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Hageman, uh, thank you for attending uh, and visiting uh, our area down in Yuma and for being here. I hope it's proved extraordinarily uh, educational. Um, yeah, I think, I think the most impactful thing is just the sheer numbers that Customs and Border Protection is trying to deal with. And then us as farmers that are operating those public and private lands uh, in, in the proximity to the border. Um, when folks enter into a field, uh, if they're not properly trained, that pretty much ends the harvestability of that particular area. So at $5,000 to $6,000 an acre, that's roughly the size of a football field. We're talking about uh, tens of thousands of acres that uh, immediately border our international boundary. Uh, and that's just in that one part of our county where the traffic is heaviest. Um, again, I urge the federal government to work with the Kokopah tribe. Um, and if they were to work with the Kokopah tribe, and then uh, get some uh, additional wall, get some additional resources put there. Uh, and then if we were able to handle the asylum seekers differently, we would dramatically cut the number of people that Customs and Border Protection is having to interdict that are not crossing through ports of entry. And that would be extraordinary. And um, the, the unusual thing is that in our community, we are short of workers every day to do work in our fields. Right. Um, and a good friend of mine rec recently approached Border Patrol about visiting some of the folks who are seeking asylum and who have entered our country uh, uh, without documentation that are being held temporarily. Uh, he approached them about uh, asking them if they wanted to do, uh, join the H-2A program. He uh, addressed over 900 uh, folks that had entered our country illegally awaiting uh, transportation or, or uh, appointments with courts. And uh, he receives received zero takers on his opportunity they're, to go to work. They're not here for jobs. They're not here for opportunity. At, at least not in the areas where they're crossing, for sure. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give a couple of metrics. I would love to have more time to address the ag issue. I grew up in Wyoming on a ranch. I've been farming, handling water issues pretty much my entire life. So I feel for both of you. But I want to give a few metrics on something that I think is very important for what we're discussing today, and that's specifically the environmental impact of the illegal crossing. For a NEPA environmental review process, it takes approximately 6.1 years. To obtain a 404 permit under the Clean Water Act, it takes 10 or more years and costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Over $1.7 billion is spent each year by the private and public sectors obtaining wetlands permits and to be allowed to undertake even the slightest disturbance to a creek or waterway. I, I had a, ca a case several years ago. I'm a water attorney and I had a lawsuit in Wyoming where one of my, one of my clients uh, cleaned out an irrigation ditch, affected 2.1 acres of land on his own property, the EPA concluded that that was a navigable water of the United States, brought a lawsuit against him, and when we went to trial, he was facing penalties of 65, almost $65 million for cleaning out an irrigation ditch on his own property. The irony is, is that none of the individuals or companies undertaking a NEPA analysis or a 404 permit would ever be allowed to cause the type of environmental degradation and destruction that the cartels and illegals are causing throughout our southern border, as shown in the photographs that we saw today. I think we have to acknowledge something, and that is that the Biden administration has gone to war with the American public. They have elevated the financial interests of the cartels above and against us. They are turning a blind eye to the environmental destruction that is being caused by the cartels and the illegals, and we are being punished for it. We not only have the, the, the economic impact, we not only have the impact on our farms and our ranches, our communities, our law enforcement officers, but our creeks, our waterways, our federal lands, our private lands are being destroyed by illegal immigration, and this administration is doing nothing about it. Again, I wish I had more time to discuss all of these issues with you, but it is something that we as Congress have got to address to make sure that we are not losing some of our most valuable resources because this administration refuses to secure our border. And with that, I yield back. The representative from Wyoming yields, and I'd now like to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to wave on to this committee. 
gentlemen, I, I don't serve on the Natural Resources Committee, but I do serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee as well as the Budget Committee. Now, let me tell you about the Energy and Commerce Committee. Just recently, I've been honored to be uh, chosen as chair of the Subcommittee on Environment and, and Critical Materials and Manufacturing. Well, I'll be quite honest with you, I've set a number of goals with, with my with my priorities of what I want to accomplish in the environment setting, but I haven't really thought about this until I got here. And then all of a sudden I hear about the impact that this is having on our environment. So know that you have influenced another committee in Congress to take action on things that we need to be taking action on, and that's very important. I also serve within the Energy and Commerce Committee on the Communications and Technology Committee, the subcommittee. And I understand that this is a problem, Sheriff, where we're hearing that, that the cartels are using the Internet to, to get people and, and, and to bring people in to help, uh, help the people across the border and to do all kind of things that we need to address Section 230 on the – and we've known for a long time, but not because of this. This was not one of the reasons why. And we need to address that as well on the Budget Committee that I serve on. We all know, and Mr. Mayor, I was a mayor in a formal life too, and you heard Mr. Curtis say that you better be careful. They may sentence you to Congress one day, but, but, um, but, but I know the budget impact. I know the impact that this can have on the budget. I say all that to tell you that, yes, this is Natural Resources Committee, but it's much more than that. This, this issue is impacting all of America. I represent the entire coast of Georgia. I'm not sure you can get any further away from this area than you can where I represent. But this is a big issue for us. By profession, I'm a pharmacist. And I will tell you that the fentanyl problem, it, 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 the crisis that we have in the country, killing 200 people every day, the number one killers the chairman told you of, of adults, 18 to 45. That is, it, you know, as a pharmacist, I was embarrassed. I made a mistake. I, I was in a town hall meeting, and I, I referred to it as fentanyl addiction. And a mother stood up and corrected me, as she should have, and she said, no, sir, it's not fentanyl addiction. She said, my son took one pill, and he's dead. It's fentanyl poisoning. It's poisoning our citizens. And then I hear, Sheriff, that, that the price of fentanyl has plummeted. And, and you know what? Simple economics is just telling you supply and demand. The supply in America right now is decreasing the price. What can we do to help you in that respect? I know we need to address it, Sheriff, on the Internet. Now, I'm going to do that when I get back to Washington. I'm going to do that. I'm going to address that and explain to my colleagues why we need to do this. How else can we help you? Well, Congressman, I'll say two things. The war on drugs needs to be readdressed. We're losing so many good Americans every day, especially our young ones, that are attached best friends to social media. Uh, that's a tragedy. That's a true tragedy. The second thing is this. we got to hold social media accountable. And I appreciate the hearing you all just did in D.C. here just recently. Uh, you, I think you made an impact on that. And, and I'll say this to you. When you can go on social media right now, anyone in this room, to include yourselves, and buy a fentanyl pill and it's delivered to your house, in our community, we call that a drug dealer. But they, for some reason, they're immune from doing that. Something's got to change on that. And thank you for the, doing what well, you Well, thank you. And thank you for bringing that to my attention. Folks, this is the eighth time in the 10 years that I've been a member of Congress and I've been to the border. Every time it's gotten worse. And now it's worse. I want to tell you what I've learned since I've been here, and this is important. First of all, I want to continue to thank Customs and, Patrol and Border Patrol agents for the outstanding work that they are doing, the outstanding work that they continue to do. I learned today or during this trip that we've got more non-Mexicans coming across the border than we do Mexicans. I didn't know that before I came down here. That's got to be of concern to us. I also learned of that, that the, the fentanyl, the price of the fentanyl has plummeted. That tells us the supply. But Sheriff, you made a, you made a comment that I think all of us are going to take with us, and that is that this is not an immigration problem. This is an organized crime problem. And until we realize that in this country, we're not going to be able to do anything about it. We are at war with the cartel. And we need to start acting that way and responding that way. I can't thank you all enough for what you do for our country. 
Thank you, Mr. Chilton. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here, and I yield back. The gentleman yields, and I'll like to recognize the chairman of the Western Caucus, Mr. Newhouse, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for allowing me and uh, other members of the Western Caucus to sit in on what's turned out to be a very important uh, conversation. I would, uh, I don't think it's too bold a statement to say that I think the number, this topic that we're talking about today is the number one issue facing our nation today. And I just want to thank everybody here, all of our panelists for participating, uh, all of the members of Congress for being here, and all of you in the audience for uh, taking an interest in helping to solve this problem. I can't imagine what it would be like living in what we've been told is the best city in the country, and I will not dispute that, but you must have a heck of a, a challenge uh, uh, every single day, and I, and I want to tell you we appreciate uh, what you're going through, and we want to be helpful. That's the point of this hearing today, to try to be helpful. You know, um, the alarming rate of uh, illegal border crossings and the impact that it's having across this nation uh, just proves every single day that whether you're in uh, northern Wisconsin, as the chairman is, south, I want to say southwestern Arkansas is where our, our committee chairman, or whether in central Washington or anywhere in the country, we now join southern Arizona as being a border state. The impacts are felt everywhere. Uh, I, um, you know, we're we're very frustrated in central Washington. We, like everybody else, have seen a dramatic increase in the number of people dying from fentanyl, fentanyl poisoning. Uh, I put together what I call my Central Washington Fentanyl Task Force. So we brought together members of law enforcement, uh, judges, uh, medical professionals, counselors, educators, even drug addicts to try to come together with ideas to help solve this problem. And certainly education and prevention are important, but you know, one thing that we've been told by some people is you might as well forget about trying to stop the flow of drugs in the country. We can't touch that, we can't deal with that, we're not gonna be able to make any difference there. And I, I wanna ask uh, Sheriff Daniels, maybe Mr. Del Cueto, what you think about that. Is that a futile effort on our part as a country to, to stop this? The return on that, Congressman, is gonna be a challenge. I, I, I agree with that, but we can do it. We truly can do it. This is a social problem in our country that we have to address at the homeland first, but we can't address it here until we secure our borders. There's no way uh, to say that. And this is not just a government problem, this is a citizen problem. The good congressman from California asked about the border and the private funds, and if I could answer that. Long story short is we had a fundraiser several years ago where the citizens of this great state put money forward. We took those funds here in Cochise County and put a virtual system that covers the whole state of Arizona, parts of New Mexico, 1,300 cameras strong. That's watched 24 seven here. We all have to do our part, and just like you mentioned. Uh, and as long as we can all do that and we can recognize, if we can't recognize that people are dying every day because of an illicit drug and a criminal cartel is killing us, then shame on us as this country. We can do a better job. Yeah, thank you. There's tons of drugs coming across the border because there are enough agents out there watching the line. Uh, I know often it's been said, you know, if you hire more agents, you can put them out there on the line. Under this administration, uh, the more agents you're going to hire, they're just going to put them in the processing center so they can process individuals faster. So the only way you're going to stop this is if you stop giving the incentives and you actually have some type of consequence for the individuals that are crossing. The cartels, yes, they control the border. They realize that they can flood one area of the border, send as many individuals as they can, they know all the agents in that area are going to be forced to go into the processing centers, and that's when it gives them the opportunity to bring their drugs across. Now, you've seen some of the camera footage that uh, uh, Mr. Childress has put up. I know Sheriff Daniels has camera footage and uh, videos that he, I'm sure he's shown you, but the reality is you don't have cameras across that entire border, and the drug cartels are very much aware of that. So it's, there's tons that are coming in that we don't even know is coming in. There's individuals that are coming in that have been apprehended on the terrorist watch list, but at the same time, those individuals have been apprehended with other large groups. And the other individuals in that same group may come from the same area of the world that they have come through, but if they're not on the terrorist watch list, they're asking for asylum and they're getting released as well. You need to stop uh, you know, just allowing them to be released 
and you have to have true consequences for the crimes that are being committed. Thank you. You know, this is a hearing on the impact of public lands. But I'm, I'm a farmer myself in central Washington, so I really relate to the testimony of you two gentlemen as it relates to the impact on your farms. I can only imagine the, you know, you, uh, Mr. Chilton, you mentioned the safety of your family, of your workers. Trying to farm, uh, trying to ranch under these circumstances has got to be challenging. I hear it's expensive. And uh, I wish we could spend a, a, another hearing just on this subject alone because it is, is so important. But thank you all for being here. Thanks for being part of the solution. And, and I see this as just a start of the conversation between us. We need to stay closely in touch. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman Yields, I'd like to recognize the gentle lady from Minnesota, Ms. Fishbach, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you, Representative Sismani, for the invitation down, and thank you to the Western Caucus, and thank you for the chair, because I think it is so important that we have these meetings, and we are out and about, and we are um, actually looking at the border, not just talking about it, and we know what's going on, and we're talking to the people that it affects. And uh, I, I, I also thank you for waving me on the committee. I actually sit on Ways and Means, but we're doing the um, field hearings too, and I, I just, I see such great value in them. So I really appreciate um, uh, the community welcoming us and such hospitality. Um, and I also really am pleased to see that you're, you're all together on this. This is a huge issue for you, and you wanna make sure that we, that we are, helping you and not hindering what's going on. So I appreciate you all being here. And, and actually, I have constituents here, if you can believe it, because they're just so excited to come down and see me. <laughs> I, I'm just teasing. They're here for other reasons than to see me, but, they, but they're um, concerned about the border, too. And that's one thing. Um, uh, Representative Stauber represents one half of the northern border in Minnesota. I represent the other half in Minnesota. And we're already, and I mentioned this to the sheriff earlier, you know, we're already getting reports that we're having illegal crossings there. And so maybe very soon, we're gonna be seeing the same problems, unfortunately. And, uh, and so we need to make sure that we are doing what we can um, to help you secure and do what you can so that we can do the same when we need to. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there's been a lot of great questions, a lot of great comments, but what I, uh, and since I'm second to last, what I wanna do is give everybody, you know, I've got, what, three minutes. If you have anything that you wanted to say that you weren't uh, offered the opportunity to here to just finish up, if there's a, a comment you wanna make, um, kind of last chance, unless Representative Collins decides to turn over some time. And it looks like Mr. Del Cuello, Cuello has something yes, he's like getting on. <laughs> Look, we, we understand that there's things that President Biden can do, but we know he's not gonna do them. And that's why we need bills and laws to come through so we can actually hold them accountable and actually get things done. HR 2 happened to be the perfect bill. There's no attacking it. But we need to pass bills. We can't just say, hey, he can do this or he can do that because we are aware of what he can do, but we're also aware of what he's not gonna do. We need Congress to work together and get bills across so we can stop what's happening on our southern borders. It doesn't matter if you're right wing or left wing, the drug cartels do not care. They just wanna come into the United States, harm American citizens, and if we continue just going, that pointing a finger of one way or the other, we're never gonna get anything done. Thank you. Well, and, and Mr. Del Cuello, can I ask, are you engaged with, um, with both parties in Congress or whoever is on that? Because we need to know before it gets to the point, uh, we need your engagement before it gets to that point, right. that there's a bill, but the input on the policy. So I'd love to see you engaged with that um, as, it's, as it's produced. So the National Border Patrol Council is engaged with, with both sides. Um, and when we do have a good relationship and we're able to talk to uh, certain individuals, obviously, uh, on, on, on either side. Uh, obviously, we have better relationships with some than with, than with others. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are engaged with different sides uh, to try to get uh, the right things done. Uh, I also, um, aside from your question, I want to thank um, Siskamani for, uh, Congressman Siskamani for putting this together and coming down here. I will add that he is one of the uh, congressmen in Arizona that has continuously been engaged and continuously makes phone calls asking not just what's going on with the border, but also asking how the Border Patrol agents themselves are doing. So I wanna thank you for that. Thank uh, you. And I appreciate make, making sure you're engaged and making those suggestions on policy because that's what we need. And I believe uh, you had a, someone else had another comment. That, oh, there you go, I'm sorry. I'm stunned that nobody's talked about securing the border at the border. 
finishing the wall. Yeah. You can't tell me that the United States government can't secure the border if it wants to. We need to complete the wall. We need to put the fiber optic communications in, the sensors in, the electricity, and put the military, if necessary, or the National Guard on the border. We need to secure the border at the border. Thank you very much. And if there is anybody else want that last word? Uh, ah, the Congress, sheriff, there you Congressman. go. <laughs> As elected sheriff, you know I'm gonna say something, but <laughs> I, I will say this. I, I did a media interview a while back and, and they asked me, some of what you've all made, I appreciate the kind comments to all of us here on this panel, but Sheriff, why do you do what you do? Number one, we signed up for it, just like you all have. But they really hit that hard. You know, we've given up. We're not going to do it anymore. We're not going to do it anymore. And I made a comment. I want to share it with the people in the audience today and you all today is, I was elected to promote this quality of life in the citizen, of the citizens of this county to include and enforce the rule of law. The day I give up hope is the day we're in a hell of a lot of trouble here in Cochise mm -hmm. County. And we're never going to give up hope. We as leaders today have to stand united, state, local, and federal. If we can do that in this country, this problem will go away. So thank you for the opportunity to address that. Well, and thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for the, uh, the whole community, um, you know, trying to, coming together to address this. But, um, and we will, you know, you heard so many folks have been here numerous times, been to the border. Um, we, I know that we are need, we have to address it, and I know that these folks, they continue to come down. And um, the fact that, what, 12 or 13 of us showed up to come down here to see what's going on, um, we'll do our best, we'll do what we can, and, and we appreciate your support and help, too. So thank you very much, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields. I now like to recognize the other gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Y'all, as an old trucker from Georgia in his first term in Congress, I ran on several different things. The border issue was right up there as number one in securing that border. Mr. Chilton, you took the words right out of my mouth. That blame wall is work, and we need to finish that wall. When I've been up here just over a year, y'all, I've had the opportunity to go, I don't know, I think on this maybe my seventh, eighth field hearing. And most of the time we sit in D.C. and we hold these hearings and we haul, haul these intellectuals in from Harvard and Yale, you know, the ones that know everything. But that ain't where the real story's at. And, and it's nice to come out here to see real people and to look out there and see on your face the concern that you have, not just for you, but for your family and for your kids. You know, I represent about 20 counties and uh, we've got a county that's it's barely 15,000 people, y'all. Man, they're losing a person, more than one person a month to fentanyl. And this is up in North Georgia Mountains, good blue collar people. You know, Sheriff, I, 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 sometimes I like to rant and don't ask questions, but I, I've got to know something because I'm, I'm, I'm like representing Buddy Carter here. I did not know. I thought that when you wanted to cross the border, you shelled out, I don't know how these folks have eight to $10,000. I thought they were poor and couldn't afford nothing. But to come, I thought you just came down here and shelled out money and you went across the border. But from what I understand, I, and I want you to elaborate just to tell the American people exactly how this works, because apparently there's certain sections of the border that you go across depending on who you are, what you are, and this thing is way more organized than just a ferry boat ride across the river. Congressman, you're exactly right on that. And, uh, and thanks to your sheriff from your district that came out and spent some time with us too, uh, Sheriff Long. Um, but it's true, it, it's the gatekeepers by the cartels that control the fees, control who comes across the country. Uh, as my, my friend here from Border Patrol will tell you too, it's $7,000 and up based on who you are, who's uh, taking the money from you. So, and a lot of those people, uh, Congressman, don't have the money, so they become servant. And that's where that word, the modern day slavery, and it's amazing we're allowing that to happen, that come to the country, they're servant to the cartels for labor, sex, enforcement, whatever the case may be. We have to address the cartels, not as a political body, but a criminal body. And then you've heard me talk about that earlier today too. So it is, it's a tragedy what's going on with these cartels. And it's sad that we're down here, state, local, community leaders doing everything we can 
why the White House and members of Congress are turning their back on that criminal cartel, because they're the ones winning here. You know, um, and I appreciate that, the criminals that are coming across, we, they don't respect our borders, they don't, res they don't respect that trash or the firewood, they don't respect our law enforcement, our laws. I want to tell you all something. You know, the, the, the hearings I've been on, the federal government doesn't give a rat's butt what you think. It's complete overreach. It's complete out of control. It's dominance. It's dominance over the American people to push us far left into a socialistic society. And if they can import people, like the people you've seen out there with these protests, that don't have any respect for law enforcement, then they've got more voters in the country. The, the thing I think I want to get across today is, and I want two things to come across. Number one, by God, the political winds are changing in this country. Sir, you're exactly right. That border bill Senate put out there, it was crap. I'm glad they didn't take it up. HR2, been sitting over in the Senate for over almost a year, y'all. Hell, it's got enough dirt on it, you could plant produce in it. <laughs> but they're not going to take that up. Of course they're not. They're not going to take up anything. They're not going to do those eight suggestions. I got them posted outside my wall. They're not going to do that. That'd interfere with their agenda. But I tell you what, November's coming quick. We didn't have, Biden had all three houses when he first came in. They wanted to really pass the board of law. They could have done it then. What chamber were they missing? Nothing. We can fix that in November. We put the right people in place up there, and by God, we'll let these folks know that came in this country illegal. It's time to go home, because if you don't want to go home, we're going to pick you up and we're going to send you home, because, y'all, it's time to take our country back. Mr. Chairman, I yield back with that. Gen Gentlemen, yields, I now like to recognize Mr. Siskamani for five minutes. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, well, again, I, I'm, I'm the, the last one, and I just want to thank again everyone here on the table for being here, for listening so attentively to the witnesses. Um, that's uh, that's what I do. This is where I get my information. So now you know um, where you know what. If you like what I'm saying up there, it's because I listen to the right people here. Um, I'm, I'm not sure though if I totally appreciate. Uh, Mr. Carter um, trying to encourage Mr. McCaw there over there running for Congress. I mean, I just, just got here. So, uh, well, <laughs> okay, well, we'll, uh, <laughs> but Mr. McCaw, uh, uh, thank you for what do you do. Thank Mayor, you, sir. I, I'll start with you real quick. I've got a few questions and only five minutes left, of course. But, I'll, uh, you know, in terms of, we, we often hear about the, partisanship on the border issues. And the one thing that I talk about in Washington all the time, that what I, it may be partisan in Washington, and it is. We've seen it. But I always say that at home, it's not. At home, we have mayors on both sides of the aisle, county supervisors on both sides of the aisle, constituents on both sides of the aisle that care about this. Mm -hmm. And I think by this panel, we have a clear example of that. But people in the audience, we have a clear example of that. Can you talk about that, uh, how this issue is not a partisan issue here at home? Yes, sir. Um, Chairman Tiffany, uh, Congressman Siskamani, the letter that we wrote to President Biden on January the 5th, it doesn't have, it doesn't have, represent, it doesn't have Republican or D Democrat on it. We have seven mayors here in, here in Cochise County that have gathered, gathered a coalition, Democrats, independents, as well as uh, Republicans to back our sheriff, to back our police, um, our chiefs, and our federal partners. We wrote a letter to him, haven't heard, only person I heard from was Representative Scamani. Um, we carbon copied uh, um, the vice president, Mr. Mike Johnson, uh, Senator Sinema, uh, Senator Kelly, uh, Representative Juan Siskamani, Governor Katie Hobbs, my dear sheriff, we always talk every day, um, but I haven't heard squeaky wheel from anyone else. That's a we, shame. We, we, we as mayors in this county are gathered together because we have an issue here. We have a problem, 
and we're going to back our sheriff, our police chiefs, and we're going to get, we're going to make sure that Washington hears our voices. I love that. And if there's something that I want my colleagues to take away from this is that example that this is not a partisan issue at home. At the border, it's not. In Washington, where we fight every day, it is. But right here, it's not. Um, I want to, uh, uh, Sheriff Daniels, real quick, uh, you know, we, we met back in uh, December and we discussed the burden on the border crisis on, on the county attorney's office and the increase in crime rates here. Can you elaborate a little bit on what uh, crime you see here on how the county is dealing with it? Well, first of all, uh, Congressman, thank you. We're honored to have you serving us here. And I will say in the short tenure you've been in Congress, you've been the most engaged U.S. Congressman I've ever dealt with. So thank you so much for leading thank us you. and everything you're doing. We're, we're honored to have you. I'll say it again. Thank you. Our biggest threat is the international draw to Cochise County by the cartels through social media coming down here. They're bringing their criminal baggage, their stolen cars, their warrants. Uh, Teenagers, we had a case out of Ohio where a, a fugitive came down here with a 17-year-old missing and exploited child from the state of Ohio. We see it all here, and the murders and the tragedies from our citizens and the death along our highways. We had a third grader walk into school and came across a migrant that came across the border legally, died in the back seat of the smuggler's car. They rolled his body out along the highway, and here comes a third grader going to school. You name it, we see it, Congressman, yeah. and that's what I'm saying. We got to do something different because we're changing lives every day in this country because we're not doing nothing. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sheriff. And I've been on on uh, spending the the night tour with you, and and you know you're still very active out there making stops yourself, and I appreciate that. Uh, speaking of that, I'll go to Mr. Del Cueto here. Um, you know, you're uh, on that same note on, on the agents. And, and today you're wearing a really nice suit and a tie, and I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. But I, I, every time I see you, though, you're, you're working on the field. You've actually been injured on the job due to the attacks that you've received yourself. The same goes for the agents that, that work there that you represent so um, uh, fervently every single day. And you speak on their behalf. And, and you and I have talked about this before. And my last question here will go to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the morale of the agents right now and what they're facing, what's happening in, in terms of the the, uh, the turnover and what that means for the force as well. So, so the morale is the lowest that I've ever seen it. I remember when uh, I first started, I would see agents that would get near the point of retirement and many of them would ask for extensions so they could stay. Uh, many other agents would stay until it was time uh, you know, for them mandatory to, to leave the job. Right now you are getting so many agents that the first thing they do as soon as they're eligible, they're leaving the job. Um, they're just saying they, they cannot deal with it. Uh, a lot of it is because, you know, they have an administration, they have leadership within the agency has, that has not backed them up. Uh, we know we've all talked about what, and we've seen what happened with the horse patrol and everything else. It is getting so difficult for agents to be out there and actually do their job and, and you know, do it knowing that they, they're doing the right thing, uh, but obviously always underneath the microscope and we have an administration that just will not back them up for what they're doing. The morale is the lowest I have ever seen in my entire career. Thank you for what you do, and thanks to everybody on the panel. With that, I yield. The gentleman yields. Mr. Lomolfa, you asked for one more minute. I will give you one more minute. <laughs> it, it's just an action. Uh, I'll, I'll throw the, an action people can take. Mr. Del Cueto, I appreciate your passion on that. We passed legislation in D.C. to do these things. On September 29, under Speaker McCarthy, we had in a continuing resolution, tough border policy. And we got shot down by some of our own dummies on that one. But previously, Last May, on May 11th, HR2 passed the House on a partisan vote, 219 to 213, and it's sitting over in the Senate. So if people want something to do, call your United States Senators from Arizona that profess to be moderate, and ask them, where is HR2? Why is that not moving in order to fix this? Okay? So one more thing you can do is call the White House and the, the eight points that Mr. Stauber listed that the, the President could do without having to pass a bill through Congress or blame us or anything on like that, he could do by executive action and it wouldn't even be unconstitutional on those eight points. He could take action. Folks, demand those actions and we'll see some results. Thank you. God bless you.
Gentleman yields, and we're going to conclude this hearing, but first, um, um, the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee made a commitment at the start of this session to have hearings across the United States of America, and we have been fulfilling that commitment, including we went to Guam earlier uh, or in 2023. We have been having hearings across the United States of America, and I appreciate him keeping that commitment. And uh, I would like to give the chairman of the full committee uh, another a um, uh, little bit of time for um, brief closing remarks. Well, thank you again, Chairman Tiffany, and thank you uh, to everyone here today for the hospitality that you've shown to us, for the interest you have to all of our panelists, and uh, to all the members who took time from very, very busy schedules from all parts of the country to come here today. And the reason we're here is because this is important. This is extremely important. And I can tell you when I became uh, first ranking member of the Natural Resources Committee and then chairman of the committee, uh, hearings on border security weren't what you would think the Natural Resources Committee would be addressing. But this problem infiltrates all of our country from sea to shining sea and Alaska and Hawaii and our territories as well. And to illustrate that, I ended up in New York City of all places on National Park Service land in Brooklyn where this administration waived every environmental law they waived NEPA, they waived the Endangered Species Act, they waived the Historical Preservation Act in one week to build migrant shelters uh, to process illegal migrants in New York City. So don't tell me that this doesn't affect every nook and cranny of our country. Uh, we all took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Our committee has full jurisdiction over federal lands, 35% of the southern border our federal lands and things happen on those lands uh, from the actions of illegal migrants that American citizens would be arrested for, would be fined or arrested for. Uh, that's not right. This sounds partisan. A lot of the things we say sounds partisan, but I want to try to be as nonpartisan as can be and just talk about the facts and the data. Since 2020, the number of illegal crossings has gone up exponentially. You, we saw it right here in the data that we learned today that in 2020, 60,000 people were being apprehended. It's 10 times that much today. The facts are when President Biden came into office, he undid every uh, policy that was there that was aimed at securing our border and opened up the border. Why he did that? I have no idea. I don't see who benefits from that. Mr. Del Guido, you made an excellent point. I don't think this president's going to do anything that he's not forced to do. And that's why we passed H.R. 2, because Congress wanted to force him to do the right thing. That's also why the Senate will not take it up and why he would never sign it into law. And it's also why anything that he would sign into law would not force him to do anything that he doesn't want to do. So. We're going to continue fighting for you. We're going to continue fighting for our constituents across this country. And we're going to continue uh, to make sure that Americans control Americans, not Mexican cartels and drug lords and despicable people that are controlling it right now. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman Westerman. And uh, just a public service announcement. On Sunday, down at the Chilton Ranch, you are welcome to join them. They're going to be installing more cameras. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And so you are welcome to join them down there as they install more cameras down on the ranch. Okay, I'd like to thank all the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for our witnesses today, and we will ask that they respond to them in writing. Under committee rule three, members of the committee must submit questions to the committee clerk by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. The hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for your responses. If there is no further business, Without objection, the Subcommittee on Federal Land stands adjourned.